Hello everyone, I'm Father Robert Spitzer. I'm the president of the Monta Center of Reason and Faith. And um, I'm on the EWTN uh, with a show called Father Spitzer's Universe, uh, which talks about everything really from faith and physics all the way uh, to the spiritual life. And I was asked today to speak a little bit about spiritual fatherhood. And of course, being a priest, I, I hope I can do that well. And uh, in addition to that, speak a little bit about uh, God the Father and, uh, and talk about what it means uh, to be a father, uh, both in the spiritual sense, the temporal sense. And, well, what other place to begin than with uh, my own father and what that meant? Because I do think um, we are uh, given a model of fatherhood to our own fathers. And um, so today, uh, you know, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about what did I learn about my father, and what was distinctive about him. As I was uh, growing up, of course, I, I learned uh, that um, there was an authority to him, um, what the Greeks would call exousia. There was something that uh, kind of emanated from him, and, uh, and it commanded obedience. And uh, I also noticed in him that he was obedient uh, to others. Uh, not only obedient to, he had been a, a veteran of two wars, so obviously he, he was obedient to his uh, officers and uh, higher rank officers in the, in the military. He himself was an officer in those wars. And um, then uh, also he was uh, um, obedient to my mother and uh, was also in, in some sense obedient uh, to authorities in, uh, beyond himself, the civil government. Uh, um, so uh, I, I could sense in, in him uh, definitely an authority because uh, uh, there was always that, uh, you know, just wait until your father gets home. Uh, you know, that was clearly a manifestation that things would not be going too well in the future. But, uh, you know, there the, the, was that kind of authority over us. But then there was also his obvious sense of responsibility to an authority beyond himself, including God. And that really was important to me. Uh, as a child, I was looking for models, and I could just see here's a person of authority who obviously uh, is subservient, it obeys, and, and I mean that, follows, uh, you know, uh, obediently, um, uh, you know, an authority beyond himself. And that modeling was very important because I think uh, every child, and certainly, you know, uh, me and my brothers, uh, we had a wild streak, you know, and uh, uh, there was a need for that. And I think that that sense of authority is good, but only the sense of authority that, um, that really uh, also is subservient itself to authority. It's not just a brute power. I'll give, uh, though, some other examples. It's not just about being obedient or subservient or having authority, but that's part of it. We all have to learn that. And if we don't learn that, then there's kind of a lawlessness in us that's allowed to just sort of take shape in uh, the, 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 uh, really sometimes the most undisciplined and terrible ways. So um, that's the first uh, area that... Uh, uh, is important, I think. The second thing that uh, I, I saw in my father was a true, uh, really a, a respect for other people. And uh, my father was an attorney. He owned uh, several businesses. He, he was a, a man who always dressed in a suit, even on Fridays. And, um, um, and, uh, but he was also a man who respected everybody. And I just remember, you know, going, you know, uh, with him, uh, you know, to his work. You know, when we were little kids, we'd go down to get our haircuts. And uh, after the haircut, Dad would take us to various places. And he'd always go to the florist to pick uh, up some carnations for my mother. And on his way there, there was always some people, you know, like these uh, newspaper men who were really, they were 60 years old and, and uh, they, they were selling newspapers on the street. And uh, my father was so respectful to these people, uh, many of whom could barely speak English, you know, and just 
you know, they'd see my father come and this big smile would come over their face. And my dad would always address them as sir, always, with dead seriousness. And uh, he'd almost bow uh, toward these people as he came up and he said, I would like one of those papers. And he'd engage them in conversation. And uh, he was just a really good human being to everyone. There was no sense of class, no sense of superiority, no sense of anything, you know. Um, you know, he, it was just so great to see. And, and we picked that up. Every one of us picked that up, that sense of, of real uh, respect for, for other uh, people and just seeing right through to the goodness of their soul, right through to the dignity of their being. My father's respect was genuine and authentic right to the core. And I learned that from him. Uh, obviously, you know, he had the good Harvard education, he had the power, he had things, but, you know, his respect was was so profound and so authentic. It, it, it was, I, I, I can't tell you what an effect that modeling had. Mm -hmm. A third example of what I learned is not just that profound respect for others, but it, it was also to do what's right. Yes, my dad had respect for the law, no question about that. My dad had absolute respect for police officers, he had respect for the laws, he was a lawyer himself, and uh, you know, and uh, so no question about that, but what was really clear too was not just to do something because it was within the laws, or there might be some force or action that would come against you if you disobeyed, that certainly played a part in, in it, but uh, there was more than that. There was also um, to do what's right because it's right and because it's of God. My dad was not a Catholic, but he was a man of God uh, and uh, clearly practiced religion. Um, and uh, as such, he, uh, uh, he definitely showed me, you know, how important that was. And, I remember once I was uh, sitting there in Long's drugstore, and uh, I was, I, I guess, about five years old, maybe uh, six, maybe kindergarten, first grade, somewhere in that area. And anyway, you know, uh, when I used to go on Sundays with him, he'd always take us for a drive, and there were these big, huge bins of Bratches candy. And, um, you know, I, the old hand would go in and take a candy and put it in the old pocket. And I had done this for several weeks. And one day my dad, you know, getting out of the car and I'm pulling out my ratchet's candy that I had swiped. And he goes, what, what's that? And I said, no, that's a candy. He said, I didn't see you buy it. I said, well, you know, there's these big bins and there's thousands of them, you know. So I just took one. And I said, oh. so that, that's wrong. It doesn't matter how many they were. That, that, that's wrong. I said, well, Dad, you know, my other friends do it. He goes, I don't care how many of your friends do it. Don't you know that that's wrong? And I said, well, yeah, I, I, know, it's, I know it's wrong. He said, well, don't try and justify it. He says, it's wrong. He says, now, did, did you do that other times besides now? I had to admit, yeah, I, I did. Said, what do you think? How many times? I said, I don't know, okay, 10 times? You know, he goes, 10 times? Okay, we're going back down the bombs right now. And we're going to pay for that. And I said, oh, Dad, I can just put it back. He said, oh, no. Nobody wants a candy that's been in your pocket for two hours. <laughs> he says, uh, we're going to go down, we're going to pay for that candy and the other candies that you took, too. And you're going to go to the cashier, and you're going to tell her, you know, that uh, you had taken from their bin. 10 of these candies, including this one, and they believe it or not, they were two cents a piece in those days. You could actually buy something for two cents. And he said, Dad, you owe them 20 cents. I said, Dad, that's like two weeks allowance. I said, you can't do that. And he goes, you're going to work it off. So down we went. He took a whole trip to go back down to Long's Drug Store, which was not necessarily close. So uh, we went down there. I got to the cashier. And I walked up and I said, well, I, I stole 10 of these, you know, over the course of just 10 weeks. And the lady's going to look at me and she goes, well, well, well that wasn't good, but uh, what are you going to do? I said, well, 
here's 20 cents. You know, this is like, oh, here's 20 cents. And uh, she said, well, and my dad, of course, is nodding to take the money. So she, uh, she rang it up, took the money, and I went back, and my dad said, oh, by the way, somebody did notice you besides me. And he, I said, well, well, who? He says, God. And he said, just do the right thing. Do the right thing because it's of God. Do the right thing because it's the right thing. And stealing is the right thing. Uh, it's the wrong thing. Paying for what you get is the right thing. So when I actually, uh, you know, I was going back, I, I actually was thinking about this, you know. Um, you know, doing the right thing. And he never took the edge off it. He called, he didn't say taking, he didn't, he called it stealing, you know, and so <laughs> it was the full sting of the, uh, of the activity. He wouldn't let me escape from it. But I think that's a father. A father does that. And him taking the time to go back down there and to do that, was really important. It was it was good modeling uh, for me. It, 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 it's, it's all about action, and you know there's so many other circumstances. You know that where my dad was so present in these this modeling the importance of faith, modeling about what, what real authority is, what a real man is, right? What we really do, and uh, he modeled in many ways too. You know the idea. Of, of yes, courage and self-sacrifice, and how important that was. And uh, you know, uh, I mean, yes, we all wanted to know his war story. What did you do? What? Uh, what? Uh, you know, and my dad said, "Oh, that's not important. What matters is that when you're called upon to do something noble, then you do it with great courage, even if it means self-sacrifice." That's the lesson. You know, we never get the full war story. You know, Dad, you got the Bronze Star. How'd you get the Bronze Star? Just tell you. Know, he says, we, we got it because of an island in the Pacific. Period. No action details. He would never talk about that as if that's what mattered. What mattered is for us to have courage at the cost of self-sacrifice. If that what was, what was required for a noble or a good deed. So what, what do I think good fathers do? Yes, good fathers exercise authority. Yes, they do. And they, they uh, exercise respect for the law, uh, which is you know, as primary as it gets. And that's kind of built into the, to the role of fathers. You know, There's a law, and there's obedience, and there's respect for it, and you ought to obey. And um, you know, not just because there's power, but because this is what's necessary for order. This is what's necessary for a good citizen. This is what's necessary for goodness. There's that rule. There's definitely the modeling of respect for others. That even if you have a, a power or you have a wealth or you have some other gifts, that's not what matters. What matters is that you respect others authentically as if they had greater access to God than you, as if the light burning in their souls uh, were greater than your own. And my dad would have said, you know, you know, if I had said one word, you know, about, well, gee, dad, you know, you're bowing at that newspaper man, you know, some snide kid remark, you know, my dad would have probably just said, he's going to get to heaven faster than you or me. And he, you know, period. And that would have been the end of it. And I knew it. I mean, I didn't even have to do anything. I didn't have to say anything. His authenticity and his goodness and his respect communicated that to me very, very clearly. And, and you know, thirdly, that modeling, too, of, uh, you know, to do what's right because it is right and because it is of God. You know, there's a huge Swiss study that was done. You know, and uh, you, you look at it and you think to yourself, well, uh, you know, it's a secular study, you know. What does the Swiss government have to gain talking about, you know, the religion uh, coming so, you know, uh, the, the role of the father communicating religion to, to children? 
But uh, they did. They published this large study. And as it turns out, uh, a father has a huge influence in not only their child's belief in God, if the father, you know, just shows that he doesn't care, uh, effectively doesn't believe, kids follow that. Uh, it's just amazing. Both boys and girls will follow the lead of, of the father. And if the father communicates that he believes that it meant, then they follow him in that. And not only that, but if he goes and shows fervor in his faith, then further than that, they will follow him in further for his uh, in, uh, now, uh, further in their faith, uh, following his. And, and so, in in a way, you look at that and you go, "Wow!" Just by going and carrying out your religious practice as you would every Sunday, or just bringing God into the conversation at the dinner table, or God in the conversation at Long's Drug Store, you know, yes, yes, this really matters. Kids are attentive to what, you know, uh, authority might be saying to what, you know, this, you know, uh, uh, this person who you sense uh, operates out of not only an integ uh, not only authority, but integrity of authority. You are attending to everything, looking at everything. Oh, fatherhood is, is really important. But enough about me. Uh, and my life, I got the point about fatherhood, and I see its importance to, to, to our society, indeed, to the, to the future of our culture. Uh, now, how did Jesus reshape the notion of fatherhood? Um, you know, uh, it's very interesting to see how, the, the, you, know, the, you know, there is a, certainly in, in Israel a male image of God for a long, long time, uh, and you know God is gives Himself a name, right? To to Moses, the name is Yahweh, which really is, you know, Thomas translates it as "I am who am." Well, this is a power name, right? This is "I am the Creator of Being." Right? It's a causative tense there in Hebrew about to be in the first person um, singular. So. I am the creator of all that is. I mean, it's almost like I am the master of the universe. I am, you know, as Thomas Aquinas would say, being itself. It's it's a big power name, you know, master of the universe, you know, embodiment of power, creativity, you know, in a sense. And there's almost that, whoa, you know, uh, uh, there's authority here. And, of course, the response is, to not just fear God, uh, but to be in awe of the majesty of God who is master of the universe. And so that's kind of the, the uh, idea you have. And for many uh, centuries, you know, the, Israel calls God, right, God of the armies, right? Uh, and, and of course, uh, a variety of, of other names, which are, you know, this power and authority uh, uh, sense of, of of God, but Jesus comes along, and He doesn't just use uh, the name for Father, the formal name. He uses the child's name for Father. He uses Abba, and, and of course, you know, if you go to a Israeli playground today and you hear the kid on the jungle gym or something, and he's you know, saying, Daddy, look at me, Daddy, look at me, you know, you hear that, Abba, 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 you know, look here, you know, that, I mean, that, that almost that trusting, affectionate, you know, kids' relationship with the Father. And so Jesus is asking, you know, that, you know, like, my Father was gentle towards us, right? I mean, we knew that, you know, if, if there were this discipline coming it would be coming, you know, in, the, in a big way anyway, be coming from my father. But uh, there was also this tenderness, this gentleness, this desire for us to succeed, this, you know, willingness to help us, this to drop everything and do what needs to be done uh, to help us. Well, it's all embedded in that word Abba, that word Daddy, that which is so trusting, which acknowledges, I know you're there to help us. You know, that's part of, uh, you know, Jesus' recrafting of the idea 
of Father. So he doesn't want us to see the Father in terms of just the first divinely revealed name of Yahweh, but also of Abba. I mean, so the, the all-powerful creator, master of the universe, God, is the same as Daddy, the gentle, accepting, supporting, wise, loving father of a child is the same as the master of the universe. So Jesus said, there's no conflict here, right? So this this is uh, uh, essentially a, uh, um, you know, a, a uh, you know, a fashioning of what fatherhood is. And, and my father was just that way too. You know, my, my father was clearly a, a person who was gentle, was wise, was, you know, uh, uh, affectionate, was uh, definitely uh, uh, wanting to support us and, and help us. Uh, yes, he expected things of us. He expected that we would be responsible to the law that we would not shame him or shame the family or shame our culture or shame ourselves. Uh, you know, there were these expectations, responsibilities. Yes, he did say, yeah, you, you have to be courageous. You, you have to be self-sacrificial. You have to do noble things and you have to extend yourself. So there were expectations, but there was all the support and all, you know, you've got your family around you, right? You've got everything here. Right, this is you know what what's expected of you. So um, you know there's that almost that uh, that uh, wonderful bringing together that where you know you just for God the Father, right? Jesus's fatherly image, uh, you know, is just at once you want to respect, bow down at the majesty of the Master of the Universe, who is at once the gentle one, the affectionate one. And 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 uh, you can see even the supporting one, the the, the one that will, will help us when we've even done the dumbest of things. And believe me, I've done my fair share and needed my support uh, in uh, the times of uh, being um, uh, the dumbest of the dumbest. And so uh, uh, all these things, you know, are there embedded in that notion of daddy. I think that notion of fatherhood that Jesus wants brought into the notion of God. If you've ever seen that painting by Rembrandt, uh, it's, it's a wonderful painting, right? Um, it's uh, there in the Hermitage uh, in St. Petersburg. And I actually uh, had the occasion to see it. And, uh, you know, the father is, the, the boy is kneeling in front of the father. He's, he, he's just come home, and I'm going to talk about the prodigal son in one moment, but just focus on the hands of the father in this painting. Because as you can see, one of the hands of the father is a big, thick kind of masculine hand, uh, you know, and the other one is rather a thin, uh, almost feminine hand. And the, the, the two hands are embracing uh, this boy. You know, there's the power, but there's the gentleness. There's the, you know, there's the expectation of responsibility, yet the forgiveness. And so you kind of get this image of Abba, uh, you know, the, in the way that Jesus intends it uh, in the gospel. There, he's kind of taking that sense of divine fatherhood now and shaping it into divine Abbahood, if I can call it that. That's uh, how, what he's trying to do. Now, relative to that, we have Jesus' constant revelation of who God the Father is. And so we've got that story of the father of the prodigal son. Now, this is an important study, as a, a parable because it is Jesus' real consummate revelation of who God the Father is. Who, right, in the heart, who is this God? And so Jesus really builds up the story. So this is this disobedient son, right? He is a, unbelievable what he's going to do, right? First of all, he, you know, he walks into the Father, and, and he says, Father, you know, I, I want to, my share of the inheritance. Just give me what's coming to me, my aunt, and I'll be out of here. Translation. Father, you're as good as dead to me. In other words, you can only get the inheritance at the time of your father's passing, right? And, of course, this is the way before the father has passed. 
right? The sun comes in and makes this demand, which is unheard of. I mean, it's shaming his father and his family. It's shameless what the son is doing. Basically saying, you're as good as dead to me. I just, all your work to me is your money. Give me the money. I'll be out of your hair. Goodbye. Then, as if this isn't bad enough, Jesus says, the son goes to a foreign land. Now, you might just think, well, that's like going to Europe. Well, no, not, not in that time. That's like going to the land of the Gentiles, the land of the Goyim. You know, here the boy has his election, right? As being, you know, not only a Jew, but bar mitzvah. And, and you know, he's, he's a person who's been accepted into his faith and his election. And you want to go live in the land of the Gentiles? Why? Why do you want to do that? And then to top it all off, the, the boy the, the, starts spending all of his money on dissolute living. I mean, you can figure out what that means. And well, the, the parable says he spends all his money on harlots and spends his money frivolously throwing it all away. His father's hard-earned money in the land of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are making fun of this Jewish boy who's doing all these terrible things and just see, see, you know, you can almost feel the shame he's bringing on his people, his country, the Torah, his God, the law. I mean, it's like almost unconscionable. And then Jesus keeps building it up further. He says, you know, that land experienced a famine. And the kid had to go to a Gentile farmer. And the Gentile farms, there's pigs. Now, if you know anything about first century Judaism, you know, you touch a pig, you get pigness on you for life. And this boy is living with the pigs. He is ritually impure on the outside, on the inside. And for, you know, in a first century Jewish mentality, ugh, he's so completely unclean. All you could just say is, ugh, you know, he's good for nothing. You just got to keep him at arm's distance, right? This kid is over the top. Now, you think to yourself, well, that kid is really in a tough you know, situation and nothing he can do because his father will formally disown him. That's what they would have thought in the first century. But this is what happens. This kid comes to his senses. He goes, oh my goodness. How many of my father's servants have more than enough for living? He's not even looking at this in terms of what he's done to his father yet, what he's done to his brother, what he's done to, you know, his country, his God, his the Torah. He hasn't even thought of that. But he's thinking, oh, man, I'm really down low, and I'm in need. And even that's going to be good enough for the Lord to call him back. Because when he thinks about it, he goes, oh, how many of my father's father servants are more than enough to eat? I know what I'll do. I'll go in the back door. I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you. You no longer deserve to be called your son. Just simply, right, uh, you know, take me back as one of the servants. So he goes back and he hopes he can wheedle his way in the back door. And as he's going there, his father sees him coming. Remember, the father in the story is God. God the Father. This is precisely who Jesus says God the Father is. That father sees that boy coming from afar off. And he's overjoyed to see this guy who's done all these horrible things to him, his family, his God, everything. And he comes running out to meet him. His love is so profound that upon his return, the mere returning of this person who's done so much to hurt him in the family, he throws his arms around him and he kisses him. No vengeance, no lecture. The boy is kneeling in front of the father. He says, Father, I've sinned against you and against God. I no longer deserve to be called your son. And the father interrupts, quick, get sandals and put it on his feet. What does that mean? In other words, slaves don't wear sandals. Free people do. Don't let my son be a slave anymore. Put some sandals on his feet and set him free. Quick, get a tunic and put it on him. A robe, right? A, you know, a, a single uh, woven robe is the sign of aristocracy. Treat my son like royalty. This kid who just did all this stuff, 
Treat him like royalty? Absolutely. That's your God. Take notice. Then, if that were not enough, the father says, quick, get a ring and put it on his finger. Well, Jewish men did not wear rings for cosmetic purposes, for decoration, right? They wore rings because it bore the family signet on it. It's a signet ring. Had the sign of family, which means you belong to my family, 100%. To wear the signet ring is to belong to the family 100%. Nothing held back. Just like our wedding ring custom. Give the wedding ring to the uh, uh, to the, your bride, and she belongs to your family 100%. And she give the ring to you, you belong to her family 100%. Now, it goes out, kills the fatted calf. I'll, I'm going to put an end to the story here, but the older brother, I just want to say this. He represents the Pharisees. He's the righteous brother. And he feels that he's been treated very, very badly. Because, you know, there's music, there's merriment, there's dancing for all this, for this son who just betrayed the family and shamed the family and did all these terrible things. And now he's back and I've been working on the field all these years and you haven't even given me so much as a kid glove to you know, settle with, celebrate with my friends, and he's mad at the father. But notice what the father does. This is your God. He comes out to meet that son and pleads and begs him. He says, please, he says, come back into the house. For this brother of yours was lost in his family. He was dead and has come back to life. That's how... Fathers, good fathers, God the Father, your Father and your God, that's how they are. So Jesus does this recrafting, right, of, uh, you know, bringing this gentle and affectionate love, bringing this forgiving and compassionate love, and blending it into all those other images that we have of fatherhood too, right? That include the images of responsibility and authority, of, of obedience to the law, of doing what's right because it's right, of following God, not only because it's right, but because God is God and we're not gods and we ought to know that. And all these things, you bring them together and it's not a dialectic of authority and love. It is a blending, a synthesis of authority and law. It's already blended for us. Yes, there seems to be an intrinsic opposition on the one hand to obedience and to love, but there really isn't. Obedience is loving and loving is obedience. And so it's that idea of humility and knowing, you know, God is God and I'm not God. I am but creature, but I am loved by God. And, you know, Seeing, you know, that God does have authority, and I have a moral responsibility to this agency outside of myself, who loves me, invites me into his very self, and who knows so much more than me, and who I ought to follow. And yes, I know I got that wild and rebellious spirit. Every kid does, you know, I, I did. There's no doubt, and at the same time, that love that love and that example of responsibility and integrity and honesty that's in the, not just the human fatherhood, but especially in the divine fatherhood, if we've learned who our father is according to Jesus, calls us there into the fullness of, of, of that fatherly light. And, and I think this is really, really important. Now we get to the, uh, uh, you know, just the third theme, uh, you know, which is, I'm just going to call it spiritual fatherhood, you know, because uh, here I am, uh, and I'm, I'm a priest, you know, and, and people address me as father. And by the way, um, you know, you can't interpret that passage uh, in Scripture that says, call no man your father is not meaning that we shouldn't call priests father or something of that nature. Uh, because, of course, Jesus uses the term father in a million other contexts, uh, you know, in, in many, many ways uh, throughout the scriptures. So that, that has to mean something else, right? So in other words, you, you don't give ultimate 
authority over to anyone so that the idea of the context in which he's talking about that is is to give ultimate uh, authority to somebody who is a mere human being you don't do that uh, that's reserved for god alone now the point i'm i'm making here though is about spiritual fatherhood itself so what, what does that mean to be you know a, a father well first of all it means everything in the foregoing two elements that I talk about, my Father and the Divine Father that Jesus has kind of recrafted into fatherhood. So it absolutely means that I have to be, first and foremost, an example of obedience to authority, an example of obedience to an authority and a moral authority outside of myself. And I have to have humble obedience and loving obedience. I, 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 I have to be an example of that. So, right, fatherhood starts first with me. Um, and, and uh, you know, before I can become, you know, as it were, an example to others, I, I got to do the, 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 the internal searching myself. So, it, it has to include that element. It's also got to include that element of having a respect for others that respect of almost knowing that person's going to get to heaven before me. I can see the light of goodness and, and, and love and faith in that person that, that's so intrinsically dignified and good and transcendent. You know, my dad's bows to these people, you know, and I could just, I, I, it's, I, it's etched in my memory to this very day, uh, to the point where I am the very same way. When I see people, I almost have that inclination, you know, just to, 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 you know, just, how are you doing, sir? And it doesn't matter who it is. How are you doing, man? How are you doing? And, and you know, you just give the, the best form of address that you can with the utmost respect because you know that, as my father would have said, he's going to get to heaven faster than you. You know, don't be so smart. And, of course, I'm not so smart. I mean, I know the intrinsic goodness and dignity of people. Well, I gotta get ten. That's on my checklist. I gotta do that first. I also have to do the checklist of make sure I do what's you know what's right because it's right, and avoid doing what's wrong because it's wrong. It's wrong before God, and it's wrong in itself. Or it's right before God, and it's right in itself. And I've gotta you know have that sense of real moral culpability, you know, that I'm responsible, that, you know, I want to be a person of integrity. Am I always? No. Uh, would I like to be better? Yes. Am I trying to be? The whole point of the exam and prayer, that's for another talk. But the point is, I really have to take that seriously and take improvements in my own moral life really seriously. Good fathers do that. They really try to be high integrity, taking moral responsibility, taking you know moral conversion and continuous progress in moral conversion really, really seriously in their lives. <clears throat> and that's really important. And of course, you can go one step further. And there's also the the the, the step of of uh, being really conscious uh, too of gentleness of heart. Of affection for others, genuine, I mean, good, healthy affection, you know, that you see people and you just know those people, even the troubled ones, are really quite delightful. I mean, you know, I could look out in the vast sea of students that I uh, would have, you know, uh, even when I was president of Gonzaga, you know, I would continue teaching classes because I love those characters. And you look there and there's all these smiles and this fascinating. But you also know that there's not just all that smiles and those smiles and spontaneity. There's all kinds of things turbulent going on in all those growth cycles that are taking place in those kids. There's a, but there's lovability in those creatures, those free creatures that are trying to find their way toward God. And so there has to be not just a delight in those, uh, you know, that gentle and affectionate love. There's also got to be that shepherding instinct. Well, how can I do well by them? Well, what wisdom can I impart to them? 
And even if it's difficult to say something, you know, maybe it's challenging to them, or maybe it's going to, you know, uh, you know, you know, tug on their uh, strings a little bit. You know, what do I say to them that they need to hear? And that's where the relationship with God the Father is so important. Because, you know, that prayer, Lord, help me to say what you would have me uh, say to them. Help me to say what you want them to hear from me. So that idea of just openness to the divine influence of, influence of the Holy Spirit, it's a Father's job to want to shepherd them along, uh, to, to try and impart the wisdom, not of Spitzer, but the wisdom of God. And even if it means that I gotta say something that may seem challenging and unpleasant, that I do that too, that I not leave, leave them in a falsity, which may feel nice in, in the short run, may, you know, come away, you know, people go, that's great, you told us to stay in our, you know, in our, you know, our, 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 our current lifestyles, just as we are. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I also would hasten to add, yes, God loves you as you are, no question about that. But he loves you too much to leave you as you are. And so how can I, Lord, be your instrument? in bringing them to where you want them to be brought for the sake of the purification of their love, for the sake of, of really protecting them from their spiritual enemy, Satan, and his evil minions who are out there and who are absolutely working against them. What can I tell them to give them the wisdom so that in the future they don't say, I wish somebody had told me that when I was 20. You know, I wish. They had told me that when I was 18, you know, but nobody did. What is it that I need to say that will keep them out of trouble, keep them on the road to salvation, keep them away from their spiritual enemy, help them to make good prudential decisions with their lives, even if it's challenging, unpleasant, pulls at the old strings, you know, I've had challenging things happen to me in my life, and I didn't like it one bit when it happened. I, I, and I you don't want to get into the, the myriads of stories uh, in it. But, uh, you know, every good father is a challenging father. My father was a challenging father, right? I've seen other great fathers who were challenging fathers. They just didn't say, you know, you are really a nice, good guy. They basically said, yes, you're a good guy but you have lots of room to grow. And here's some ways you can really grow. And it's, if you just follow this advice and trust me, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's gonna make a huge difference in your life. Now, good fathers also develop credibility. So they don't just give challenging things, right? And just leave it. But there has to be something in you, something about the quality of your personhood. I saw it in my dad. Right, uh, I think Jesus saw it in his father, Saint Joseph. Right, he sees something about that. It's it's a credibility building thing. So you sort of know, you know, in in a way that if you are a high integrity person, or you're an authentic person, or you're trying to say something in a way that it may be challenging, but it's respectful in its challenge, they can detect it. You know, kids, not just kids, everybody has antenna, right? They know if you like them. They know if you respect them. They know if you have their best interests in mind. I, I don't know how they know, but they know. I mean, it's just amazing how I would call, uh, not, not just adults, but kids of every age, they're authentic love determiners. They've got these antenna that know right away, you know, uh, that, that something is, is is authentically loving or something is not authentically loving, or you are who you say you are, or you're not who you say. Now, you might be able to fool some people for a short while, but by and large, people get it. They know over the long term that, you know, you, you kind of, you are who you are. Now, as such, then, a trust develops in who you are, 
which unlocks a door to their hearts, which means that they're likely to accept some data from you. So you can be a spiritual father. Now, what do I mean by spiritual father? Right? I'm not anybody's real father. I don't have real children, right? So, uh, but you know, real fathers, you know how that gets, right? You, you, they're they're regular. You, you, of course, everybody wants the every child wants the respect of his or her father, right? There's no question about that. You want your father above all to respect you, to love you. Of course you do. Yet you can get rebellious with your father in a way. Now, sometimes you can be overtly rebellious or sometimes you can be covertly uh, rebellious, right? You can do things behind his back and things of that nature. But it's hard to do that with God, especially if you have a keen faith. You know, the covertly rebellious is, is tough to get away with. But I'm a spiritual father. I, I, I always have this role of the external consultant. You know the old phrase that I never uh, uh, take advice from one of my own managers if I can get it from an external consultant, right? It's just, you know what I mean? We give credibility to external consultants all the time that we never give to our, our internal managers. Now, the, the point I'm trying to get to, of course, is that, is that as a spiritual father, I got the external consultant role, uh, you know, in, in the industry, as it were. So I can actually bring to the fore this idea of, you know, um, gee, I, uh, you know, I'm not so sure about that. You know, people go, whoa. You know, I mean, just if I, if I said it that way, but, you know, uh, gently, you know, or, you know, oh, have you thought about this? You know, like you get, you see a track, you know, that, that might be there. But you, you, you say instead of, you know, saying no, you know, you, you say instead, well, have you ever thought about this? Or, you know, my dad, you know, always answer a question with a question. But the, the point, of course, is, is that if we can ask a right question or we can just put, you know, a remark that's a little bit, you know, um, uh, fatherly, challenging, that just says, you know, hmm, you know, but if you forget this and this, uh, that whole thing could just turn upside down. Um, and, uh, of course, my dad had a great expression called, let me see if I have that right. Now, whenever I heard that, I knew my argument was about to be torn to shreds nicely. And, of course, he would, he would always, uh, I, I would give him some argument for something, you know, and he would go, let me see if I have that right. Now, you're saying A, correct? And he would say, yes, yes, I'm saying A. You know, and, and now you're saying B. And I think yes, yes, I'm saying B. But you can see that A and B here are inherently conjugate. Got it there. I, I got it. It's not. Uh, I got to re refabricate, refashion. You know, I'm, I'm going on reset here. So, uh, I mean, you know, now he, he, it was nice, but it was also he saw things that uh, I didn't see. What was that, uh, you know, uh, statement of uh, Mark Twain, you know, uh, when I was 17, I was just amazed at how stupid my father was. And now that I'm 21, it really amazes me how much he's learned. <laughs> <laughs> and so I always thought to myself, well, I, I think I some, got it somewhat, the paraphrase somewhat, right? But in any case, you know, it's so true. We, you know, as I look back on my own father, it's just amazing how wise he, he was. But again, spiritual fatherhood then, it does have, you know, we got to, Bring all those forces of good fatherhood into our being. So number one thing is take care of the father within first. The, the, this, you know, and that goes for all fathers, right? So, you know, fathers of, uh, of uh, you know, children, father, spiritual fathers. We got to take care of the, the father within, and building up that, you know, respect for God, that modeling of faith, that modeling of the law, that modeling of integrity and doing what's right, that modeling of respect for others and the uh, love of your wife and spouse and children and that gentleness yet call to responsibility all blended into the dialectic of of love and, and authority all these things you know you got to take care of the father with him but the second thing so important as well is that we also have to uh you know bring to bear uh you know something you know within us that's that's 
you know, rises to the challenge of good fatherhood. I ought to be a good shepherd. I ought to be someone who's going to nudge people along toward their spiritual growth. A good shepherd doesn't let the wolf get at the sheep. A good shepherd challenges the sheep so that the sheep are prepared for the wolf. A good shepherd actually helps to develop, right, the sheep so that they can, you know, not only just remain within the main flock and be guarded, but also uh, have that power within themselves to know that they too are responsible to authorities outside themselves, that they too must be obedient as well as have these great freedoms of the, you know, of their rights and and, and uh, so all of these things are brought to bear where we're not just saying, you're free, do whatever you want. Well, you are free, but you can't do whatever you want. Otherwise, you're going to die a slow death. You are going to lead others down the path of destruction, or you may destroy other people and their lives, or you may also wind up leading people away from salvation, and you yourself may play right into the hands of your spiritual enemy and choose your own eternal uh, destiny away from joy. I mean, oh, you don't want to let that happen. Good father's good protector gets people ready for, you know, there's going to be challenges. God loves you, but he loves you way too much to let you stay who you are. So yes, God does love you as you are, but he's going to be a good father going to challenge you to move beyond where you are so that you can get to heaven and lead others to do so. So that's part of the whole idea of spiritual fatherhood. But spiritual fatherhood has another dimension besides just shepherding. A good consoler. What? Fathers are great consolers. You know, my father was a great consoler. You know, things would happen. You know, my mother was a great consoler. And I think that's uh, task, you know, mothers and fathers absolutely share in common. And, uh, you know, and my, I mean, some days, you know, you come home and some guy just knock you silly on the playing field, you know, and what happened to you? You know, well, I lost the fight, you know, and uh, and uh, so and so finally got the better and he pushed me out of the banyan tree, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, you know, and my dad looked at me and goes, well, you know, winning a fight is not the most important thing in life. Needed to hear that, right? Because you know your ego is bruised, mm -hmm. and you know you get publicly defeated, you know, and you gotta live with it. And the, you know, my dad said, "Okay, you know, okay, here's a failure. Is this the end of the world? No, it's not the end of the world, you know." And so, you know, he, there he was. He's a good consoler. You know, he goes, "Look, you know, it's." Happened to me, it happened to the brother, you know, this happens to everybody. You know, you gotta kind of learn, you know, as uh, Clint Eastwood would say, a man's gotta learn his limitations. So does a boy. But uh, my point in trying to get to is, yeah, good fathers are, are good consolers. They have a sense of, of what to say. A sense of, you know, you don't have to be, you know, John Wayne. You don't have to. You know, a sense of, you know, at once learning humility, learning who you are, but also a sense of what's really important in life. And I put it in the form of this question, and this is what I, I basically tell a lot of people. I wrote a whole book on suffering because I think, you know, the role of being a fatherly consoler is really, really important. But anyway, the, the, the point in the book is this question. What does this have to do with the whole order of salvation? That's a really good question. And I had a, a very good friend once, uh, you know, Bill Watson, Father, you know, Father Bill Watson, and we were in the novitia together. And, uh, you know, I, I was not the, the best athlete, you know, let's face that. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we got to the novitia, you know, volleyball game going on, and, you know, and uh, I figured, you know, Who's, it was game point. Who's going to serve this volleyball? Right? And I'm looking at this big six foot six guy. <laughs> and I knew he's going to serve that thing right to me at 100 miles an hour. I just knew. 
<laughs> coming my way. Sure enough, you know, bam -o! So, of course, this thing comes <laughs> down on me, and it's so rapid, I'm trying to get underneath it with my hands. They hit it up in the air so my, my colleague can hit it over the net. <laughs> and, of course, <laughs> the ball goes off, you know, and goes to the other end of the field. We lose the game. And I just felt horrible, you know, as usual. The weak link in the chain, you know, just let the, the game go. So I'm walking off the field, my friend Fuzzle Watson walks up to me and goes, uh, Spitzer, uh, what does this have to do with the whole order of salvation? <laughs> I thought, that's a really good fatherly question to ask. Yeah, what does it have to do with the whole order of salvation? Not much. Doesn't have a lot to do with the whole order of salvation. This game will pass. No one will remember. It will go into our examinations and no one will care. And so, for all intents and purposes, I, I leave you, you know, good fathers are not only good shepherds, good fathers are good consolers. But they're good consolers with really good prudential wisdom as well as good example of turning to the Lord in trust and help. Finally, my last point about good fatherhood. Good fatherhood is open to God the Father. Good fatherhood is open to our ability to, you know, open ourselves to the will of the Father. That's a hard thing to do, you know. I mean, uh, you know, everybody with an ego has trepidation about saying, okay, Lord, Come in and transform my heart. Okay, Lord, you do it your way. Okay, Lord, you do it according to your will. Okay, Lord, you know, all right, lead me. You know, I'll follow you. I mean, there's something inside of this guy that says right away, you know, well, Lord, I thought I already thought of the right way. <laughs> and I just thought I'd take the liberty of creating a list that tells you of the exact steps to take in order to get this goal reached. And by the way, uh, you know, I've also uh, determined a timetable that I think you might take my <laughs> suggestions and so forth. And thank God, God does not do that. But instead, God leads me according to his wisdom and his life. But the humility and the trust, right? These are fatherly virtues. We take it from our divine father as human fathers or as spiritual fathers, we take this into ourselves, right? And so we got to be good modeling examples of trusting the Lord that much. And I do, I do trust the Lord. I know his ways. I know how he leads. I know what he does. I know that he's a good shepherd. I know this is true. I, it's happened to me a million times. I've written my own spiritual autobiography, as it were, uh, for myself anyway, not for any publication, that's for sure. <laughs> and, uh, but I've done this, and I know how he works. I know he's trustworthy. I know how he transforms. I know how he uses our defects. I know how he uses our failures. I know how he uses our weaknesses, just like 2 Corinthians 12, right, when you know Paul is saying, Oh, you gave me a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting proud. Yet, I asked three times that you take this from me. That means over and over and over again, like a million times. But you saw fit not to. Now I know that in my weakness is my strength. For as I grow weaker, Christ grows stronger within me. So true. So the example of a good spiritual father is in my weakness, right? I'm blind. You know, you think, oh, wow, what an assault to masculinity. You lost your driver's license. You non-autonomous, can't carry your own weight soul. My response as a good father is, who cares? <laughs> what does this matter in the whole order of salvation? My response as good spiritual father is, if this doesn't matter, if weakness instead will bring Christ into me more strongly, and it does, oh, he uses every bit of this to strengthen you in grace according to his will, which will lead you to salvation, help you lead others to salvation. Well, that's the job of a good spiritual father, is to give that not only example, 
but that not just that teaching, but to say to encourage people, do what I do. You know, open yourself up and just say, Lord, you lead at me. Lord, you are the wise one. You be my strength and my weakness. You bring me to the transformation of my heart according to your will. Good spiritual fathers are humble, openness, open to the Lord's will. They're not worried about their own autonomous strength. They're worried about opening themselves up to the real strength. For in my weakness is my strength. For as I grow weaker, Christ grows more strongly within me. I think that's basically what a good father does.